Welcome to the News House. I'm Amy Littman, and today we have Mary Nestle here to talk with us about her work as a nutritionist, food industry critic, and author. She has written multiple critically acclaimed books, including most notably one entitled Food Politics. She is also a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and writes about health topics for her own blog. Thank you for joining us today, Marion. It's a pleasure to be here. So, how do politics relate to what goes into our mouths? Well, politics have everything to do with what we eat. The easiest way to explain it is agricultural subsidies. I used to think that agriculture had nothing whatsoever to do with nutrition, and now I think you can't understand anything until you understand how our agricultural system works, with subsidies being the most obvious example. We subsidize corn, soybeans, and wheat. We don't subsidize fruits and vegetables. That's why fruits and vegetables seem so expensive. So when did you decide to go into nutrition? When I was given a class to teach, I was teaching at a small undergraduate college and I got given a nutrition class to teach. It was like falling in love. And you can teach anything through food. You can teach biology, you can teach mathematics, you can teach sociology. Everybody can relate to it, everybody eats. How can food regulation make Americans eat healthier? Well, there are lots of things that regulations can do. Right now, we have a regulatory system that encourages people to eat as much as they possibly can, as often as they possibly can, in as large portions as they possibly can. We could change those regulations to make marketing to children much more difficult, for example. Um, we could uh, insist on a size caps on cer certain kinds of foods the way Mayor Bloomberg is doing in New York. Um, there are lots of ways in which the regulatory landscape could be changed to make it easier for people to make more healthful choices. What are some of the ways you think that we could get that, me you could get that message across to people or, and help them? Well, I actually them. think we need to change the food environment. We really need to change the environment to make it easier for people to make healthier choices. And the best example I can think of is the large portion problem. If I had, I'm always saying, if I had one thing I could teach, it would be that larger portions have more calories. I can't even say it with a straight face, but it's not intuitively obvious. Now looking at some ways to kind of change what Americans are doing to, when they're eating. In the most recent election, California voters turned down several food initiatives. Um, mm. Can you explain what these are briefly and talk about your opinions on them? Yeah, well, there were three that got really a lot of attention. The most obvious one was the no on Proposition 37, which was um, a bill introduced by a petition in California to label genetically modified foods. I was greatly in favor of that. I think genetically modified food should be labeled because consumers have a right to know. They want to know, they have a right to know. But the um, food industry across the board contributed about $46 million to the campaign to defeat Proposition 37, and it did go down, and it went down by a sizable margin. Um, although not as sizable as I think the no on 37 people would have liked. But I think that because the interest in getting genetically modified foods labeled is so great, uh, this will start popping up in other states as well, and we haven't heard the last of this one. Now continuing with politics, with President Barack Obama staying in office, that means Michelle Obama will remain our first lady, and of course she has taken several steps to try to combat childhood obesity. Do you agree with the things that she has done? Oh, I think I admire her extravagantly for the Let's Move campaign, which focused on childhood obesity as the cause that she was going to be working on. It was a very, very good choice. And the particular way in which she was going to go about working on it was also a very good choice. She wanted better dietary recommendations uh, for the public. She wanted better food in schools. And she wanted better access to food, to healthy food in low-income communities. These are all very good ideas. And in the first term, uh, she was able to get the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act passed, which got the Department of Agriculture to set standards for school meals. Uh, those have been very controversial, and so one of the things she's going to need to do in the second term is to get those institutionalized. 
What do you say to people who say they don't want what their child eats to be regulated either in school or just in the grocery store? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can understand that. And a lot of people feel that this is a tremendous imposition on their personal freedom. But we already have regulations that determine what's available. Those regulations are already there. This is a tweaking of regulations to make them healthier. As one consumer advocacy group said, an 850 calorie lunch for a teenager would not be argued about at all if it were a hamburger and french fries and a soda. What's being argued about is the presentation of healthier foods. And if schools want to implement these healthier food regulations in schools, they have to work with the kids to explain why these foods are good for them, to get the kids to try things that they might not have tried before, and hopefully to teach kids how food is grown and how to cook it. Because once you do that, the kids will eat anything. And what are some ways, and what's your maybe your number one tip for people trying to eat healthier? Well, the big problem now is obesity. And for that, the single most important thing to do is to eat less. Uh, it's not much fun, but it uh, works every time. OK, thank you so much, Marion. Remember to check back at thenewshouse.com in the future for more interviews with notable public figures. Have a great day.